Uh, I think some of us had maybe a different version of this yesterday by travel on groundwater governance in Rajasthan. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me, first of all, I really enjoyed the conference. Uh, and in developing this talk, I, um, uh, in talking with Tushar about what to talk about actually, um, I wanted to think about uh, groundwater governance uh, in Rajasthan, and in doing that I started with the, the new um, uh, state water policy which is uh, passed in 2010, uh, and looking at that, um, I couldn't really find any effects to talk about with respect to groundwater yet. Uh, and so in that regard, um, I've seen some uh, with surface water, so I'm actually talking about that today. Um, so we'll get uh, all bases covered um, uh, in this session. Uh, and so um, uh, I'll just dig right in then with talking about the relationship between uh, the new state water policy um, and uh, the urbanization of water, uh, as I'm calling it, um, <coughs> uh, which is uh, one of the outcomes uh, thus far. Uh, so I'll just uh, uh, dig right in here. So the, the 2010 state water policy uh, is a landmark and even perhaps path-breaking piece of natural resource legislation. Uh, this is so for two reasons. Uh, first, the highly contentious politics of resource use in the arid and semi-arid state and region where the uh, agrarian voting electorate uh, 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 outnumbers the urban uh, has all but ensured an action with respect to any form of government policy that would reduce access to irrigation. Um, uh, and it's path-breaking second uh, because the final policy has a long genealogical history and is a product of multiple iterations um, of model bills from the central government and input from multiple development donor agencies, academic experts, and, and, and international and Indian NGOs. Uh, the character of the policy reflects these two facts uh, and as the artifacts of these processes, contentious state politics and outside influences uh, particularly those around free market oriented development agencies uh, that I want to examine uh, today. Uh, and so specifically then, uh, the state water policy represents the culmination of a shift in Indian water development, I believe, from the rural to the urban. Uh, the effects of which on irrigation continue to unfold, uh, and this paper then examines the historical development of this policy uh, and its initial impacts on irrigation in Rajasthan, uh, which I believe is a proxy uh, for the rest of the country. Uh, so the, uh, I've divided the paper into four further parts. First, uh, provide a brief outline of the contentious history of water politics uh, in the state, which have made it extremely difficult um, to pass any comprehensive legislation. Uh, and second, um, I want to examine the historical development then of the current uh, 2010 state water policy for Rajasthan. Uh, and in this section in doing so, I want to pay particular attention to the various interventions uh, especially by development donor agencies in crafting the guiding principles of the policy. Uh, and then before concluding, I want to, uh, in the third, third section, I want to discuss some of the initial outcomes of the ongoing implementation uh, of this uh, policy on the redistribution of water, social power, uh, and water scarcity. <coughs> so according to the 2011 Indian Census, Rajasthan's population is over 75% rural which has actually increased slightly over the past decade. So rather than with most of the rest of India, uh, Rajasthan has become more rural uh, over that period. Uh, so this is coupled with the voting electorate, uh, where over 60%, sometimes as high as 68%, uh, regularly turn out in polls, uh, with rural voters vastly outnumbering ur urban voters. Therefore, no party, uh, not Congress nor the BJP, uh, has wanted to be the party that turned off the rural irrigation tap. Uh, this tension is reflected in the history of Rajasthan's effort to craft and adopt the water policy. In 2005, for instance, uh, then Irrigation Secretary S.N. Tandi uh, proudly announced that the new state water policy uh, was ready for adoption. Secretary uh, Tandi uh, indicated that the state government had broadly accepted the recommendations given by the expert committee led by Professor V.S. Vyas uh, of IDS, who drafted the legislation. Uh, it was simply a matter of presenting it before the assembly and passing it. Uh, of course, it only passed five years later, in 2010, under a Congress-led government. Uh, in a slightly different form, from either its 2005 or its revised 2008 version. Uh, so I'll return to this transformation in the next section. Uh, but going back to the development of the 2005 draft policy, it comes after several efforts in the 1990s to craft a statewide policy. Uh, but also after a series of interventions uh, by donor agencies uh, and the central government, which I was talking about yesterday. 
Um, so it's to this genealogy, this history that I want to now turn. And so I'll spend the bulk of the rest of the talk uh, examining some of the high points of this history uh, before turning to the impact of these shifts on water development, uh, governance, and use. Uh, so space permitting it does not prevent a, a full treatment of the uh, uh, history of the water policy development in Rajasthan. Uh, therefore, I want to begin in the 1990s, a period characterized by the liberalization of the Indian economy uh, and the state. It was also a period that witnessed a conservative push uh, towards rationalizing the use uh, of both, uh, rationalizing the use and management of both ground and surface water. Uh, so this proceeded in two parallel movements uh, at the level of the central government. First, the central government crafted uh, the first model bill to regulate and control the development and management of groundwater in 1970. This was a result of rapidly declining groundwater levels, as we all know, uh, due to the rapid spread of green revolutionary uh, electrified uh, bore wells. Uh, and then the model bill was then revised in 92, 1996, 2005, uh, and 2011. Simultaneously, the central government drafted uh, national water policy statements in both 92 and 2002. Together, these two bills uh, were intended to serve as a model of surface water and groundwater regulation for states. Uh, but before I turn to the impact of these model bills on Rajasthan's approach to water governance, uh, I want to highlight the deep parallels between these model bills and a 2005 World Bank report that most of you are probably familiar with, the Briscoe Report. So in the report, India Bracing for a Turbulent Water Future um, identifies two major problems exacerbating ground, the groundwater problem. Right? Indiscriminate pumping of groundwater, mostly by uh, irrigation dependent farmers, um, and the provision of free power uh, in the agricultural sector. And the World Bank proposed uh, 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 four solutions that are pretty straightforward and based on market-based principles. Uh, the first is defining and setting water entitlements, or transferable rights over water, uh, closely related to entitlements. As a second principle of clearly defining property rights uh, over water. And the third is increasing supply and efficiency through further technological expansion, uh, both respect to more efficient irrigation systems, uh, but also uh, with supply side interventions, uh, including more surface water dams. Uh, and the fourth one is establishing water users associations, uh, thereby localizing governance, uh, while noting the need for state level water authorities. Um, and the World Bank supported its recommendations uh, in a really big way uh, through an increase in rural water sector loans uh, from $250 million between 1999 and 2004, uh, which increased to $1.4 billion between 2005 and 2008. And then between 2009 and 2012, we see an increase both for rural and urban sector uh, at $2.9 billion. So a massive increase uh, over the last decade uh, in loans for water development, uh, especially in the urban sector. So these loans have historically funded both infrastructure expansion and technical assistance. With respect to technical assistance, uh, we see the same language almost verbatim from the World Bank report in defining water scarcity and solutions in the central government's 2005 model bill to regulate and control the development and management of groundwater. Uh, in the same year, uh, the state of Rajasthan drafted the groundwater, or excuse me, the Rajasthan Groundwater Rational Use and Management Act of 2005, um, uh, and uh, the act uh, follows the World Bank recommendations with respect to highlighting ownership, uh, pricing, local governing bodies, water user associations, um, and further technological expansion uh, as the foundation for groundwater reform. Um, the act also, though, emphasized setting up a state groundwater authority, a regulatory mechanism, uh, and dissemination of awareness uh, and knowledge of groundwater scarcity. So the composition and powers of the authority, uh, which is very hierarchical, are clearly defined in the act. And this is quite important when compared to uh, the policy that did pass. Uh, so the act, uh, though, uh, appoints a chief groundwater officer uh, and forms a three-tiered hierarchical groundwater authority. The first tier is the Rajasthan Groundwater Authority at the state level. Um, it's composed of seven, uh, it would be, again, composed, uh, composed of seven high-level elected officials and 15 appointed members. The second tier uh, is the district groundwater authority composed of two elected officials and 10 appointed members. And the third tier is the block groundwater authority composed of one elected official and eight appointed members. So the composition in various levels of the authority is therefore overwhelmingly appointed rather than elected, um, drawing into question what decentralization really means in this regard. So I digress somewhat into this discussion of Rajasthan's draft water uh, uh, draft groundwater policy, or act, excuse me, in 2005 uh, for two reasons. First, it demonstrates the close connection between the state, central government, uh, and uh, uh, donor agencies. Uh, and second, I want to note that 
The 2005 Rajasthan Groundwater Act has yet to pass, whereas the state water policy uh, passed in 2010. But interestingly, there are some subtle but sharp divergences between the 2008 draft water policy and the 2010 draft water policy as passed. Namely, the 2008 version uh, called first for the formation of river basin organizations, which would interface between water user groups uh, and the state. And second, for the development of aquifer-based management systems. Both of these were imagined as civil society institutions that would occupy the meso scale between the local water user groups and the state. These approaches, which would strengthen civil society, were not included. Oops, I forgot to advance my slide. There we go. Um, the, uh, these approaches, which would strengthen civil society, were not included in the 2010 state water policy. Instead, inserted subtly into the 2010 version is a section on institutional restructuring that includes the establishment of the water regulatory authority, regulatory authority uh, and institutional restructuring of the Water Resources Department, PHED, and Groundwater Department to improve efficiency and delivery of services, quote unquote. Uh, and in this case, the particular notion of efficiency is quite important. Uh, so this is where efficiency is meant in the sense of neoclassical economic theory where the efficient allocation of resources is where those resources are allocated to particular activities that generate the most exchange value or market value, right? As opposed to subsistence value. I'll return to this notion in the next section, but perhaps more importantly, the idea of creating an authority uh, and institutional restructuring uh, in a more vague form uh, was important from the stalled 2005 Rajasthan Groundwater Draft Bill itself a product of central government model bill, which itself is a product of uh, specific World Bank reports and direct technical assistance. So I'd like to suggest that this language was added to the state water policy because of the inability to pass in a specific form through the groundwater bill, which spelled out exactly the formation, functions, and powers of the authority, such as setting limits on two-well construction, uh, but also as a way to reassert state authority from the top to the bottom. Recent work from uh, Narayana and Kamath working near Udaipur in southern Rajasthan have shown uh, how this form of decentralization has actually exacerbated inequalities in access to irrigation water, uh, groundwater irrigation water that is, uh, while leading to a democratic deficit in local governance institutions. Something that I've talked about in previous work. Um, so the adopted state water policy is very a number of further points, including legal entitlements, pricing, and eventual shifts towards full cost recovery of operation and maintenance of water provision. It also stresses the need to create awareness of water security's character and water's need to be allocated efficiently at the community uh, or block level, district level, and state level. These levels mirror those levels of authority designed and called for in the stall 2005 draft groundwater bill. So while well, Rajasthan's 2005 groundwater act has yet to be passed because it's specific in goals and its mechanisms to meet, the, meet them, it is therefore open to critique and to political accountability of elected officials, whereas a state water policy uh, is sufficiently vague where implementation is left open to unelected technical experts, both private and public. Um, uh, and uh, I don't need to remind people, I believe, that uh, the, at least for, with respect to Rajasthan, this is not the state of the social state of, of Gandhi and Nehru. This is the new state, a state aimed at attracting inward investment, uh, privatizing state assets and governance, and encouraging GDP growth. It's the public-private partnership state that Sunita was talking about yesterday, uh, which has been highly contentious. A state that uh, Michael Goldman, uh, speaking of Bangalore and Karnataka, has turned a speculative state after the world international financial institutions are engaged in highly risky behavior, including subprime lending and rapid infrastructure uh, expansion, where risk is socialized and profits are privatized. In other words, the 2010 state water policy displaces the need for the creation of unpopular details of water regulation away from elected officials and renders them a technical matter, because to not do so would impede GDP growth, even though it may be at the expense of democratic decision making. In short, it leaves enforcement and strategy open, which is both a strength and weakness, uh, but thus far has led to unintended consequences in both management of ground and surface water, and it's to these out intended outcomes that I want to turn uh, now. So space permitting, I want to discuss uh, one of the main outcomes of the implementation of the state water policy, uh, which I've documented 
uh, thus far. Uh, specifically, uh, with respect um, to uh, uh, oops, to uh, uh, reallocating water for um, away from agrarian towards urban purposes. So, uh, in 2005, uh, Rajasthan's expert committee on integrated water development resources, uh, led by Professor Vyas, as I mentioned previously, with the input of the European Commission, the World Bank, the ADB, uh, groundwater board engineers, and others, first noted the population of the state is expected to double to 200 million by 2050. Uh, and second, due to this population growth, um, uh, that uh, water use for irrigation needs to be reduced from 83% to 70% by 2050. So certainly some of this 13% reduction of rural water use can be met through uh, enhancing efficiency, particularly with groundwater, which serves over 70% of the state's irrigated area, 80% of its drinking water. Uh, but some of this transformation will need to be met, particularly in the short term, through transfers that will leave irrigation-dependent farmers of both surface and groundwater in the lurch. And this is exactly what is happening in the Benoist River Basin uh, which serves the Bisapur Dam. So Bisapur Dam was built during the late 1990s as both an irrigation uh, and drinking water project. But in 2009, the project was completed with funding from the ADB and Japan Bank for International. Please, 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 sorry. Please sum up. I thought I had a half hour. No? Okay. Well, I apologize. I thought I had 30 minutes, but I, I have 20, I guess. Um, so okay. So I'll just say a few things about this then. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the dam reservoir complex was built in the 90s, uh, but in the late 2000s, uh, it was, it was um, uh, uh, tapped to serve uh, the growing needs of Jaipur. So you can see it's 130 kilometers from Jaipur uh, to the south. Um, and uh, uh, in April of 2010, two months after the um, uh, state water uh, uh, policy passed, um, the uh, Water Resources Department issued a removal order uh, for 27,000 anti-cuts uh, in the Benas Basin. Okay, so this cut off uh, uh, legal irrigation canals, um, and uh, uh, ultimately, um, okay. Um, so I just want just to, to finish then talk about the shift with respect to uh, from uh, uh, agrarian to urban uses then. Um, so the shift is problematic for two reasons, both from the perspective of irrigation uh, and from uh, supply to growing population. With respect to irrigation, uh, farmers in the Benas Basin have been making significant investments uh, in irrigation capacity, including pumps, piping, and the like since early 2000s when the Bisapur Reservoir came online. Much of these investments have been through high interest money lender loans, uh, which of course are still uh, coming due. Uh, this is resulting uh, in forced land sales uh, and reduction in farming families' livelihood capacities. Uh, for instance, families are abandoning their children's uh, educational pursuits so they can put them to work in support of the family farm. But it's also problematic with respect to population growth, which is the primary principal reason uh, that uh, this uh, shift is being driven according to policymakers. Uh, so by 2020, Rajasthan is expected to still be 65% rural. Uh, so to be fair, there has been growth in rural water supply development uh, projects. Uh, but, um, but really then, uh, it draws into question, uh, uh, since livelihood strategies are mostly geared around irrigation in the rural sector, what are these folks going to do? Uh, and so the urbanization of water then um, is not only about particularly uh, urban demographic growth, it's also about uh, growth to feed uh, growing urban needs and a sense of supply-side urbanization, uh, where it's viewed as, or being framed and, and uh, discursively constructed as about um, needing uh, to transfer water from agrarian to urban uses uh, to, to uh, uh, serve growing urban populations. Uh, but, but in reality, I believe, um, it's a, uh, water is being transferred to urban uses in order to, uh, in a supply side way, uh, to fuel urban economic growth, uh, which uh, produces much more uh, GDP uh, than agrarian. So thanks all.